uh, decidedly male this morning. Our ladies are off on a ladies weekend retreat. And uh, so we have a few female represent representatives here this morning. Um, but it's going to be a lot of growly guys as well. So uh, we're going to, there's some, you know, the, the guys have been taking care of the kids. So we have very low expectations. <laughs> very low expectations. Hey, hey, I've seen you watch your kids before. <laughs> we're so glad that everybody's joined us live on Facebook and here in the auditorium. Sure, appreciate seeing everyone. Let's go to the Lord and uh, let's, let's do some uh, worshiping together, shall we say? Just one word, you stop the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. You believe that this morning? Just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall He can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. What do we have to do? I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith rise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. Not a prison wall He can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Guys, if your wife's at home or if she ain't, it's the truth. There is nothing that our God can't do. Aren't you glad about that? From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love You bore my weakness You took my shame Buried my burdens And fields of grace Oh, you called 
called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. From the highest heaven, you stepped down to earth. In the sun perfection, gave your life for us and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe. For we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. In your lead me home in your presence where I belong oh you called me out lifted me up how great is your love from the heights of heaven you stepped down to earth innocent perfection gave your life for us and we are amazed yes we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your love Miss Kathy. There has never been, there will never be, God like you, love so true, there has never been. There will never be a God like you, a love so true. There has never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. There has never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. Yeah, how great, how great, how great is seated. Thanks for joining us today. Um, what a great time that we're going to have today as men and some ladies as well. So thank you. These ladies stayed over just to make sure we're doing things right. Amen? <laughs> That's right. They got to get us in line here. So uh, just great uh, opportunity for us to be able to gather to get today as brothers and sisters in the Lord. I heard from the ladies. Uh, Joy texted me and called me. They said they're having a blast. They don't want to come back, y'all. That's, pro that's a problem. So, but nonetheless, they got scorpions, too, in their cabin. So anyways, that's something I'm sure we'll hear about that uh, in a short bit. So a few quick announcements that we have is that on the 
22nd on a Saturday of this month, members orientation class. It will be in the fellowship hall. So if you've not, um, if you're interested in joining our church or would like to know more information about it, it's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in our fellowship hall. Lunch will be served, right? So just to be able to get more information and to be able to get history on our church, and uh, would love for you to join that. Uh, that is going to be uh, led by uh, our, our our deacon. Um, Wendell and his wife. So, so just more information about that. Please see Mr. Wendell uh, shortly after this. Next, okay, a week from today, 523, we're going to have our fish fry fellowship. We are still needing one or maybe two burners. If you have one that you can kind of just, uh, you got it? Okay, all right. Talk to Mr. Larry there. Mr. Larry, okay. So, yes, uh, from last week. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, we're going to have lots of fun. We're going to have, we're going to encourage you to bring a side dish or a dessert uh, and to bring a friend as well. Uh, so bring your best uh, hush puppies uh, for us. As we're going to do a contest on that. I had to really ask about that a little bit today in our Sunday school class because I don't know what's in there, but it could be fish, it could be corn, it could be cheese and all that stuff, right? Nobody knows? Okay, all right, okay. As long as it wasn't really puppies, I think that's the important no, thing. No, I think it's essentially fried cornbread. Okay, yeah. essentially, yeah. My girls were, were concerned. They're like, are they going to have, like, puppies? No. no. That's what they were thinking about. So just to clarify, <laughs> so if you uh, were going to do a contest, that would be a great time for us to do so. And then uh, our next announcement is that on the 20th of June, believe it or not, we're having our mission trip. So if you have not signed up, if you have signed up and not completed your paperwork, please make sure you see me or Miss Modell as soon as possible so we can, can get you. We're trying to get all our final numbers in. Last but not least, this is something new. We are actually doing and planning for our youth day camp, uh, similar to what we had last year. This time it's going to be on July the 27th through the 30th, so there's more information. I'll be announcing that on the way, but it's going to be basically locally what we're going to do, and then we're going to just... Uh, uh, kick that off on the 27th, and then we'll end on the 30th uh, at, at a beach. So it'll be a fun time for us to get together for the youth. Uh, we're, uh, I'm currently working on a guest speaker for that, so there's going to be more information. Other than that, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, I'm glad the ladies are out just hanging out and stuff, which is great. I think they're due back sometime in the afternoon or so, maybe a little afterwards, two or three. It doesn't matter as long as they get back. That's all that matters um, for me. All right, let's pray. Father God, we come before you. Thank you so much, Father, for your faithfulness, Lord, as you open up this day for us to worship and to keep this Sabbath holy. Lord, it doesn't matter, Lord God, who's here. Uh, we're just thankful, God, that we got souls here listening, Lord, to the word, and may we be challenged by it. And for those that are tuning in at home, I pray that they would join our fellowship soon to get us where we need to interact as brothers and sisters in the Lord, so that, so that we can be more equipped, being able to be encouraged in doing the will of our Father, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for this day. May you bless and anoint our time together today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll Amen. hand it over to Brother Carl. So, fish fry next week. There's a reason to come back, guys. <laughs> um, we are going to go into our time of worship where we... Uh, we're going to pass offering plates. We're going to share out of the abundance that God has given us. We're going to ask the people online on Facebook if you are a part of this fellowship that you also participate in the giving. And uh, so, gentlemen, we're so thankful that you are here to receive our offering this morning. And uh, let me let me lead us to the Lord in prayer. I was I was going to tell you a story. I guess I will because I really want to. But, but the reason they call them hush puppies, Pastor Jackson, the reason they call them hush puppies is because most of the time the cooking was done in an outbuilding or outside. And so there were dogs on all the farms, right? And so when they would be cooking, the dogs would be clamoring around for food, and they would throw them a little piece of fried dough and say, hush puppy. That's the story anyway. So that's, just, yeah, thank you for that applause. I appreciate that. I could have said a paw. That would have been a dog reference, but most people wouldn't have gotten that. But anyway, Father, we love you. We thank you so much that we can come together in fellowship and in love. We come together with a purpose as well, God. Uh, today, it's not all men, but it's, it's a lot of the men in our church. And God, this is, 
This is the this is the leadership, the spiritual leadership of this body that's gathered together. Not that ladies are not spiritual leadership, but guys, we're supposed to take a leadership role in our lives. And so I pray, God, that today, as we worship together, that you would do in us something that can only be explained by your power and your presence, that you would call us, and that not only would you call us, because you've been calling us, but that we would hear you, that we would obey you, God. May your name be glorified, God, as we give all of ourselves and we share our resource together so that we can bring honor and glory to your name by sharing the gospel message here in this community. Father, we love you. We lift your name up today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
finish the 13th chapter of Corinthians 1 Corinthians with these words for these three things remain faith, hope and love but the greatest of these is love and the greatest love is the love that he poured out for us on Calvary we've waited for this day we're gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise oh your presence in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the sky descending like a cloud you're standing with us now Lord, unveil our eyes You're the reason we're here You're the reason we're singing Open up the heavens We want to see you Open up the floodgates A mighty river flowing from your heart Filling every part of our praise Open up the heavens We want to see you Open 
up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Oh, 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 oh. show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power. this morning and this is our prayer God that you would open up the floodgates of heaven that you would pour out on us God your spirit that we would have our eyes and our ears open to hear you and that we would obey you like you told your people in Deuteronomy that you called us out to listen to you God and not only just to listen but to obey every word that you say God we pray right now God that you would show us your glory that you would show us your power Thank you so much for this simple prayer, God, that you would do in us today something that only your power and your presence could explain. How could that possibly happen? God, we lift up Jackson this morning. We pray, Father, that you would open his heart and his mind that as he speaks, Holy Spirit, your voice would speak to us, that we would hear from your word, that we would understand, that we would be able to grasp the truth that you have for us today and that we would act on it, God, that we would carry with us out of this place the intention to obey you and to serve you this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. I'm going to take you guys to a historical figure that you and I may or may not know. I want to introduce you a man that you have heard about perhaps in your Classical church history or history in general, this man's conviction and his stance and questions started a revolution called the Reformation. It is this man's faith that changed the course of history of many Anglicans and Catholics it, as he stands strong, which caused the birth of Protestants and Protestant churches abounding more than you can imagine. His name is Martin Luther, born in Germany in 1483, whose father was a prosperous businessman. In his academic pursuit, he had to choose between law or theology. Okay. After enrolling in law in 1505, while on his journey, Luther got caught in a violent thunderstorm in which a bolt of lightning nearly struck him down. He considered the incident a sign from God and vowed to become a monk if he survived the storm. The storm subsided. Luther emerged unscathed and true to his promise. Luther turned his back on his study of the law days later on July the 17th of 1505. Luther turned, uh, sorry, instead he entered an August, Augustan monastery to study theology. He studied in the, at the University of Erfurt and Wittenberg and taught biblical studies. But in early, early 16th century Europe, some theologians and scholars were already beginning to question the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. 
It was around this time that the translations of original texts, namely the Bible and the writings of the early church philosopher Augustine, became more widely available. You see, Augustine had emphasized the primacy, the primacy of Bible rather than church officials as the ultimate religious authority. He also believed that humans could not reach salvation by their own acts, but that only God could bestow salvation by His divine grace. And in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church taught that salvation was possibly, possibly through good works or works of righteousness that please God. Luther came to share Augustine's two central beliefs, which would later form the basis of Protestantism. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church's practice of granting indulgences to provide absolution for sinners became increasingly corrupt in 1517. A fairer named John Tetzel became selling, selling indulgences in Germany to raise funds to renovate St. Peter, Peter's Basilica. So basically in this, this form is that you can, uh, he can offer up salvation if you sign this paper and give money to raise funds for St. Peter's Basilica. So, committed by the idea that salvation could reach through faith and faith only by the divine grace of God, Luther vigorously objected to the corrupt practices of selling indulgences. Acting on this belief, Luther on October the 30, uh, 31st, 1517, defiantly nailed a copy of his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. You see, the 95 Theses would later become the foundation of the Protestant Reformation, as I mentioned earlier. Were written in remarkable, humble, and academic tone, questioning rather than accusing. The overall thrust of the document was nonetheless quite provincial. The first two of these theses contained Luther's central idea that God's intent for believers to seek repentance and faith alone, not deeds, would lead to salvation. For some, this might be old news, but I assure you many have not heard of a man named Martin Luther that took the stand in his religious community to assert questions that brings us back to the Lord. Not man's way of receiving salvation by grace through faith so that no one can boast. So as we transition, I want to make you aware of another man that we have been studying in the book of Acts named Paul of Tarsus, who stood up to what is right and paid for it. Because of his stance, we have more than two-thirds of the Pauline epistles, the New Testament, written and inspired by God so that we can answer life's greatest fears and greatest promises in Christ Jesus. So as we stand and, and read God's Word, I want us to turn to Acts 17, verse 16 to 21, five verses in reverence of God. I want like you guys to stand up as we read this short passage. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed that the city was full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplaces every day with those who happened to be present. And some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers were well conversing with him, some saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say? Others, he seems to proclaim the strange, a strange, of, uh, strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this kind of teaching which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know these things, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. You may be seated. Thank you so much. See, the background is, as we're going through the second missionary of Paul and Silas and Timothy, they go from city to city, town to town. They first started in Antioch to Tarsus, where they met with Timothy, and to, to a city called Derbe, 
and to Iconium, right, which we've kind of talked about a little bit. But God was redirecting Paul because Paul wanted to go to the lower part of Macedonia, lower part of Greece. But instead, God forbids him to go instead to take the route north to Troas and to all these islands, right? Eventually to Philippi, where he received the Macedonian vision, to Amphipolis, to Thessalonica, to Berea, and now to Athens is where we are at. So what I wanted to share with you today is that Paul, Silas, and Timothy goes from these cities to towns to answer life's biggest dilemma, death. For to them, it was a mission critical for them to share that salvation is not found in philosophies, as we'll see later on, and academics. It is not found in God's small g, who are dead. For them to take a stand means they need to declare the authority of both biological and supernaturalism of Christ Jesus. See, Abraham Lincoln said this, Be sure you put your feet in right places, then stand firm. We must stand firm more than ever in our life today in 2021. Billy Graham, the evangelist, says this, Courage is contagious when a brave man takes stand and the spines of others are often stiffened. Thomas Jefferson, another president of ours, says this, In a matter of style, swim with the current. In a matter of principle, Stand like a rock. See, we are in a predicament as Christians and churches to stand of what we believe in in Christ because we are being attacked from multiple directions, right? And in, in, in trying to minimize God and to maximize humanity. But we know that Jesus is 100% God and 100% yet without sin as we're going to go through this. So what, was, what should we do? What should we do to stand strong, to stand, taking the stand as men and women of God? As we see here in the verses that we just read, that there is anger. Anger in the spirit causes movement to the soul. Anger in the spirit causes movement to the soul. So verse 16, it says here, Now when Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed that the city was full of idols. Provoked means Paul was angry. He was irritated. He was distressed at what he has saw the city was full of idols. Who are these idols, you might question? Well, you have to think back of the great Greek mythology and religion of that time. Their god consists of 12 of the Olympians. Okay, you're thinking, what? The Olympics? What are you talking about here? In the Olympians, right, you have Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter, uh, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Arius, Hepa, uh, 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 Ephraphidite, Hermes, and uh, Hestia. These were called the Olympians because according to the, their tradition, they're resident on Mount Olympus, right? The Olympians were a race of deities. So there you go. We have one God, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's all we need, right? One God, the God of God, the King of Kings. But you see in Greek mythology, there are these 12 gods, and they lived as a family, okay? The Olympians were a race of deities primarily consisting of the third and generation of immoral beings that were, that were worshipped. They gained their supremacy in a 10-year-long war of gods in which Zeus led with his siblings to victory over the previous generation of ruling gods called the Titans. Okay, so you got these words. These are were these, uh, the words and, and groups of what we see today in kind of like Hollywood, right? We see these things. But significantly, Paul, he was angry because those gods were not immortal they have to fight other gods for 10 years really if you think about it that doesn't make sense our god the god of the bible didn't have to fight he just said it he gave he gave his only begotten son as a sheep to be led to the slaughter he gave his best for us all yes not just 
the Greeks, but also to Westerners, right? All types of ethnic groups and cultures for all people all the time, 2,000 years ago and still 2,000 years later. Perhaps Paul's righteous indignation was indeed anger, but not in the sense of anger that you or I typically respond when we're hurt. It's righteous anger that causes movement. Movement that we want is to give them oxygen to breathe in their uh, physiological decay into breathing life of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says this, Be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down in your anger. You've heard that, right? Do not be angry. Actually, the Bible says it is right to be angry in the context of Christ. It should be right that when we see people perish, they believe in this small gods with a small g. They, be, they put their life into things that are finite versus infinite. We should be angry. We should be ambitious more than ever to share the gospel. And that is the point here. Proverbs 29, 11 says this, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. So it's not just sharing, it's not being just angry and, 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 respond, and reacting, but it's responding in movement in Christ. Because I believe that when we are angry, actually God, that is perhaps a good thing. Not angry because I, you know, I, I, I stubbed my toe at the door jam or something like that. I'm not talking about that anger. It's ang anger that moves to share the gospel of hope that you and I have. So imagine this. The hope that we have as Christians, as I shared with you all, as believers, the Holy Spirit lives within you and me. As believers, it descends upon heaven and it comes and lives in you. So when you're about to say something, when you hear something, when you're, when, when you're about to uh, uh, say something probably really smart, the Holy Spirit tells you, oh, maybe you should not be saying that. And us as older men, as more, more adult, more, more mature men, we realize that, man, had I known that knowledge before, I would have probably saved myself a lot of heartache versus when I was younger, when I would re react immediately like this, right? But see, as, holy, as, as children of God, the Holy Spirit descends. And it's not, should, it, we should not be just angry. We should be angry that somebody may not know Jesus Christ may not know that whenever they die, they will eternally be separated from good, from God. Somebody mentioned to me, Jackson, hell is best described this as this. Hell is living a nightmare day in and day out. You can never wake up from it. Many of you guys know that when we have bad dreams, have you ever had a bad dream before? where it's something silly and you have a bad dream, but you can't, your heart is, is pumping really hard and you are scared and you're, you don't even know what you're scared about. But imagine this, that you can never wake up from it. That is your reality day in and day out. See, that is, the per, I, I believe, one illustration of knowing that when we die, if we do not give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be forever separated from God, right? And it's not by good works that you earn God's favor, as we saw in the story of Martin Luther. It's the story of grace that only God can give. So we live in a society, and I'm kind of going off script a little bit, where people are, we need to be inclusive. As Christians, they believe, the world believes that we are exclusive but that is not true. We are more inclusive than anything else. We include everyone of all faith to come to know that come and know and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and He is the only way to, to heaven. But it's only through Him, everyone, no matter what time, no matter where, what continent, no matter what time zone, you can come to know Jesus Christ. So we should be angry, righteous indignation to know that. If somebody continues to live this way out of rebellion to God, against God, that they will forever be separated. There is no peace in that. So it should move us as brothers and sisters even more to share the gospel. That is our hope. That's the reason why we're here. 
We're not here just to take roll. We're not just here to count the, the, your donations. Those are great things. Don't get me wrong. But you're here more to be equipped so that you can become a difference maker. You can become a peacemaker. You can bring an offering of peace and hope to somebody that will forever change their trajectory in life. Psalms verse 7, 11 says this, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. See, he's so righteous that he's so, uh, he's so angry that we do not come to him enough. To stand for the Lord also means that we need to maximize Jesus Christ and his bodily resurrection. To maximize Jesus Christ and his bodily resurrection. Acts 17, 17 says this. So he was reasoning, Paul, in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, in the marketplaces every day with those who happened to be present, and some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers as well were conversing with him. Some were saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say? Others seemed to be proclaiming strange deities because he was preaching Jesus Christ and the resurrection. I want to encourage you is to know your audience. When you're sharing the gospel, know your audience. These people were mixed bags of people, Jews and Gentiles and Greeks, thinkers, followers of philosophical groups, the Stoics and the Epicureans. What are the Stoics? The Stoics followed that of movement of unfeeling, the rejection of emotions, right? So that's, what they, that's where we get the word Stoic. Hey, he's so Stoic, right? They have no feeling. It was a movement. It was a popular sub-movement of Greek mythology and Greek, Greek practices, and the other group are the Epicureans, right, who followed pleasure. Everything was pleasure. They love pleasure. They love self-indulgences. This is where we get the word he, he, uh, hedonists, right, hedons, somebody that, doesn't, that loves pleasure at all times. So you have Paul comes in in the picture to proclaim and introduce and not just balance the pleasure or no feeling. Paul comes in to maximize something that is greater and that is Christ Jesus, the God-man. So let me just review who Jesus Christ is. And I've said this many times, but it's a really good review. It's a good, a good review for me, and I believe it's a good review for us to know and anchor who Jesus Christ is. Number one, he's pre-existing. See, Jesus didn't come and was born, right? First century A.D. He was pre-existing beforehand, even the, before the time began. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us create the image of man. So this is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that was already existing in the book of Genesis, right? This is called in, in, uh, in, in church word or doctrinal word, this is a theophanies, right? Where we see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit already there. So he goes, he is pre-existing beforehand. He was not created, right? He has always existed. Number two, he's eternal. He has no beginning and no end. He doesn't expire. You see, these Greek mythologies and Greek gods, they had a, they had a birth and they all died. And they even had to fight a 10-year war. Why would you have to fight if you're a god, right? So think about it. He's eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. Number three, he's fully human. He's fully human. He's fully God at the same time. This is so important, yet without sin. He leads a, a sinless life. Number, number uh, Next, he voluntarily set aside certain divine attributes in his earthly ministry. Right? So he became, this is where we get in Philippians chapter 2, that he emptied himself. Right? He wasn't less or greater. He emptied himself of his human ability and power that he had so that he can feel and know exactly what you and I go through each and every day. Right? He humbled himself. Number next, he paid the penalty of sin with his death. As, a, as today we're going through this in our Sunday school with our youth, is that, you know, the parable 
of, of, of the, the servants, right? Where, where, where this master of the land, he leases the land to this, to this rancher, this farmer. So he tells them after, after the yielding its fruit, he tells, he sends servants, three servants. And they wouldn't listen to him. They even harmed the servants. And at the end, he says, you know what? I'm going to send my son. Because my son, they will respect my son. So his son comes, and what they did, they do, they beat him and they killed him. You see, but we know in that, uh, in that parable that Jesus becomes the cornerstone that people have rejected. Does that make sense? We have reject, they have rejected God. Jesus also rose from the dead in his resurrected body. Guys, this is something that is so important, y'all. He was resurrected. Okay, no other God out there, no book that you could read, no book in leadership, no book in other religion can even come close to Jesus Christ. Right. He was resurrected and then he ascended into heaven in Matthew 28. And he says to those people as he ascended that he's going to come back the same way. He's going to come back. Have you guys watched the news recently? Have you watched the wars happening now? right? Tension in Jerusalem. Well, those places where there's war, Jesus proclaims he's going to come back the same way. So if you're in total denial of who Jesus is, if you think he's just a fictional character, he's going to come and all these things are working together, knowing he is going to come back. He will return. So where does that lead us as, as men and women of God? How do we maximize Jesus in his bodily resurrection? Well, I think there's no greater passage in the New Testament than John chapter 3. Verse 16 says this. You guys know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through Him. The one who believes in Him and is not judged, the one who does not believe in Him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light, for their deeds was evil. Let me stop there. Guys, there's... If you are not aware, there's evil. But people want to live in evils. Therefore, we need to maximize Jesus more than ever. We need to stand strong. We need to stand strong and stand firm in our belief and not give evil a chance to ever come close to what we believe in, right? To ever come close to come to your house, to your business, to your church. We need to hate and call evil out. Does that make sense? We need to stand strong. Number three, we need to recognize and accept the invitation to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. We need to recognize and accept the invitation to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 19, and they took him, Paul, and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing something new. I wish I had that much time. Seriously, I wish I had that time to just sit there and have people talk about things that don't even really matter. I wish I had time. I have no time. But nonetheless, it does happen. Right? So how do we not only maximize, how do we know when to kind of dive in? Right? It's listening to these social cues. When do we know to dive in and actually kind of cash in and share the gospel? When do we know that? Well, as we see here, it was an invitation. Perhaps, brothers and sisters in the Lord, perhaps God may be inviting you to share the gospel to somebody. And we're not aware of it because we're so busy listening to nonsense. Instead, listening and cueing and to say, man, when is it the time that I could share the gospel where they invited Paul here in this passage to share the gospel to him, right? To, to them, sorry. 
So one of the things that we need to do, one of the best ways to share your faith is to live a godly life. We must live a godly life. Non-Christians often look to you and me, right, our actions, not when we're at church, but when we are in difficult situations where we're in knee-deep, not thinking about a situation right now specifically, need so deep, they're looking at your reaction. Are you truly a Christian by how you act, how you say things, how you present, how you problem solve that situation, right? So non-Christians often look at Christians as hypocritical, hypocritical because we say one thing but to do another. Show those, clo- uh, show those close to you that you care You spend time with them, you help them in their needs, and listen to them when they have problems. You may not be able to answer all of their questions, but they can't deny that the reality of what Christ has done in your life. If you find this hard to do, perhaps God is speaking to you about your own needs to walk with Him closely every day. So we nonetheless have to live our godly life. Number two, Another important aspect of sharing your faith is to pray for those you're interacting with. How many of you guys honestly say, hey, when I'm I'm in this situation, I'm maybe witnessing, sharing, right? Do you actually pray for those individuals? Maybe perhaps saying, you know what, when I'm in uh, in a difficult situation, because remember, people know that you're a Christian. They should know you're, you're a Christian. Okay, they should know if 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 they don't know that you you're a Christian, then you might to, you might to, uh, have to kind of share that a little bit more openly, but they're watching our action. But because they're watching our action, maybe whenever you're in a conundrum, you need to be praying, Lord, help me to represent you well. It's hard. I, I, I'm there. It is hard. Number three, we also have to make a habit of reading scripture, praying, and going to church. These things are shouldn't be done for attention or for the sake of just doing them, but to help you in your growth in the Lord. In my opinion, it, what you get from church is what you put in. Right? We know that, right? In school, same thing. We tell our, our, our students, right? You need to really pay attention. Do you know that if you sit in the front rows at a class, they say statistically that your grades are going to be higher than those that sit in the back, right? Now, who, show of hands, how many people sat in the front of class? <laughs> One, two, three, maybe, okay, four, okay? And I assume everyone sat either in the middle or all the way in the back, right? Okay? Statistically, if you're there, if you're it, so when you come to church, when you approach God, you're like, Lord, this is your word. Help me to be ready. I got my pen, I got my highlighter, and I'm ready to highlight, to make notes so I can feed. Versus, versus saying, hey, you know what, Lord, whatever you want to speak to me, whatever I open, <laughs> and we all have all done this at some point, speak to me. And then you read there, well, you don't even know the context because you didn't prepare for it. Does that make sense, right? So I encourage you to build a good habit of having Bible study. Build a good habit of praying. <coughs> build a habit of going to church, right? I've said this before to our leadership in particular. If you're not reading your Bible, if you're not praying, if you're not going to church, if you're not being actively involved in Bible study and things like that, you shouldn't be a leader. Bottom line. No, no, there's no, I'm just being honest with you. You should not be a leader. And I share that because as leaders, we need to, what? We need to live by example. And if you're not living by those very basic principles of standards of church leadership, you shouldn't be in leadership. Bottom line. So these things should be done, again, not for our attention, but because of our passion for Christ, right? To help others see that there's something different about you. As Christians, I'm telling you, you have to be different. If there is a situation in this department and they know you're a Christian, you ought to be the first person or the second person they can think of to come to for any of life's situations that we face in. If not, if you're the last person, then something is wrong here. You need to reevaluate who you are in the Lord and how you're representing horizontally to the world that you live in. So at the same time, we must do more than to live godly lives. People need to hear the gospel. 
They need to hear that God loves them. They need to hear that Christ died for them. They need to hear that they can have eternal life. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. This is the last passage that I have here before we go into the simple stages of sharing our, the gospel. It says this, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Guys, if there's such a time, this is the time to share the gospel. This is the time to not talk about politics, to talk about the heart of the gospel. That is what saves people, not your politics. Okay? Not your good works. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ more than ever. But how will they know? The news media is not going to say, if you want to come, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you need to come and, and say this prayer. They're not going to do that. They're, they're, they're far apart. You, you, right there in the office, you in that department, you in that classroom, you in that situation, you're the best person to present the gospel to them. If you don't, we need to have a conversation. If you don't feel like it, we, we need to have a conversation because that's what a true mark of a believer is. Let me share with you four simple steps in sharing the gospel. And I'm very open about this. I'm very emphatic. I want to show you how significant this is. You need to tell them about God's plan, His peace and his life, God loves you and wants you to experience the peace and life he offers. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you don't have, if you say to me, well, you know what, I have none, no one to share the gospel with. Well, perhaps maybe you're full, you're living life full of Christians. That's fine. But God called us to be a light and salt to the world. We need to maybe put ourselves out there a little bit to share the gospel, right? We need to tell them about God's plan, His peace and His life. Number two, we have to share our problems. Share our problems, what? The separation of God. When we have sinned, we are automatically, we deserve death. That the only bridge to that is Christ Jesus, nothing else. But if you live in your little hole and little place where you don't have any interactions, there's something wrong. You need to put yourself out there to tell them and share with them life's biggest dilemma. And as Christians, we have the answer. We have the answer to it. Right? For all have sinned and fall short in the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Number three, talk about God's remedy, the cross. The cross. God's love bridges the gap of separation between you and him. When Jesus Christ died, and, uh, died on the cross and rose from the grave, he paid the penalty for our sins. And the Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By, wo by his wounds we are healed. 1 Peter chapter, four, chapter 2, verse 24. And number for our last step, our response is to receive Christ. The cross is the bridge to God's family. When you accept Christ's free gift of salvation, the Bible says, but as many as received them, to them he gave the right to become children of God. We're children of God. That's an amazing thing, right? We are the children of God. So what do we need to do? We need to receive Christ. And a person needs to do four things. We need to admit that we are a sinner. I'm just kind of, you guys know this from growing up. You need to lead somebody to the Lord. You need to share the gospel is what I'm saying. You must tell them that they need to admit that they are a sinner. They need to ask for forgiveness and to turn away from their sins. And they need to believe that Christ died for you and for him and for her and for me on the cross and to receive Jesus in their life, in their heart. Simple steps, right? Accept, believe, and confess the ABCs to our uh, dilemma in life. So let me close out with prayer as we end our service today. Father God, we come before you. Thank you so much for the cross. 
thank you, Lord God, that we have a purpose. <laughs> Number one, not only do we have a purpose, but we have the God-man, Jesus Christ, who has lived as an example for us through the living Word of God, and that the Holy Spirit descends from heaven into our hearts. Wow, that is, that is and should be powerful for us. Lord, help us awaken our hearts, God. We need to know this is mission critical. We need to take a stand with all these strange teachings in the world that tells us to be happy means we have to earn this much. We need to earn six figures. We need to earn this. We need to earn that. We need to have this and we need to have that. Lord, the world is far from it, Lord. Ultimately, what leads to happiness is having peace in you. Lord, help us, God. Help us, awaken us. Send a revival. Send an awakening for our church and churches beyond through our state, through our country, and through our world. We need you more than ever. Lord, the gospel is never falling short, Lord, here at our church. And I thank you so much for that. Whether there's women here, there, whether there's not, whether there's a few of us here, whether there's a lot of us here, it doesn't matter. This is the gospel. And perhaps you've sent us as men to listen to this so that we can actively encourage and challenge our families to be difference makers, to be peacemakers of this world. Perhaps you've put the women away right now in their retreat so that they can be, they can rest, so that we can step up as men. And if we've not stepped up, Lord, forgive us. If we let them educate our children only, Lord, forgive us. Help us to educate. Help us to be breadwinners in educating our families at home. And it starts at home before the workplace. Because we know, Lord, that we are easily dispendable as men in the workplace and as women too. But, Lord, at home is where it counts. So, Lord, help us, Father, in our everyday being to stand strong and people need to know that we are Christians that whenever they're in situation they would say what would this Christian from my workplace do how can I talk to them how can I share with them we need to be apparent we need to be transparent we need to be obvious so that we can come and open that door for them for us to share the gospel to them and to make disciples Lord Father God, help us in our everyday to not fall asleep. Help us every day to not think of just retirement. To think of, hey, if I had this time off, I could have this. Lord, there's more than that. It's a spiritual war. Help us to be strong, Father. Help us to be aware and help us to stand for you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right. Well, this is uh, your time to respond. If you need some time, again, very few women here. Men, I know sometimes we're afraid to come up. Uh, I want you to use this time for you to pray. To be praying for your wife, praying for your children, praying for your house, praying for your business, your workplace. This is your time to respond. So I'm going to open up this platform here to, for you to come and pray. And let me be able to pray with you as well. You come. This is my desire. To honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Lord.
Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart I worship you, all I have within me I give you praise, all Every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way. Amen, amen. Thank you, guys. Um, woo! We made it through. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Well, we want to pray for you guys, and um, uh, we've got a lot of prayers, guys. We've got, we got a lot of going on. Um, if you guys are, if, not, if you're not included in the prayer chain, let us know. We would like to include you there. Uh, we got some people that are going through health issues. Believe it or not, we've got people that are, you know, just sick, okay? But we've got prayer for financial issues, too. We've got prayer for family. So I pray that we would be awakened by these things, but also to count the blessings that we have. Marriage, fantastic, right? Okay? Kathy, God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> you still had your stick, I fear. Okay, all right, okay. Make sure there's no sword in the stick there. Yeah, it's a secret. Anyways, all right, sorry. Kind of getting in my ninja mode. Anyways, um, <laughs> but we've got a lot to be prayed for, to, to pray and, and give the Lord thanks. We're alive. We're alive. We can come to church, right? We can come to church and bring our families and come and make this time. We are building traditions. So help us to be thankful for that. Let us pray, Lord God, Father, we come before you. Thank you for the marriages that's represented here and the victories that you have gone through. Thank you so much, God, for them. Thank you for those that are in the midst of things. I pray, Father, for them in the midst of the valley, a shadow of death, when there's fear, when there's pain, when there's uncertainty, Lord, I pray that you would be with them and answer them. Give them peace that only you can give. Lord, we pray for those that we've lost, dear loved ones, brothers in the Lord, companions, friends that we've lost recently. I ask God for you to give the peace that only you can give knowing they've given their life to the Lord, we will spend eternity with them. And Lord, I pray lastly for us, awaken us, God. Help us to be sensitive to those that are in need and they need to hear from you. Give us boldness. Give us courage. As long as it's called today, as long as we're breathing today, we have a life, we have a duty to do to share the hope that you can only provide. Thank you so much, God. And I thank you for our women, Lord, whose most of them are in our tree and those that are here still. I pray for all the work that they do each and every day at home, at the workplace, at church, serving, Lord, giving. I pray.
pray that you bless them even more. I pray that when they come back, they would be renewed, refreshed, refocused into one thing, sharing the gospel. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your kindness in our church. Thank you for the victories, and we celebrate the anniversaries. We celebrate even sometimes the pain, knowing that you are God. You're greater than all. And help us to go through those things, Lord, to give us courage, to give us hope, and to realign us where we need to be walking with you faithfully. Father, we love you. May you bless us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.